truth about the, this this doxology that Paul goes into, and if you've been coming, you realize that's a big word for Paul. Just praising God, he's getting a case of the can't help it, and he's just magnifying God. And we're been looking in verse thirty three past few weeks, and talking about where it says. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, exclamation point. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. So the context was, was from what Paul had been saying about all the doctrine that he's been teaching us through Romans to what God's got in store for Israel in the future and what He's doing for the Gentiles now and and just all that God's doing, Paul gets overwhelmed and he just goes into praise and he says, by the way, boys, he says, God's ways are past finding out. You're not going to have Him figured out. And he talks about how wonderful that knowledge of God is. And so us knowing God, and we, we've been journeying through what happens when God actually meets with His people. And uh, last week we got to Ezekiel 1 where He manifested Himself. Uh, in a very special way. I want us to go to Ezra chapter 3 tonight as we continue on that line of what happens when God meets with His people. So back in the Old Testament there in Ezra chapter number 3. And I want you to see verse 10. Of course, if you know anything... Ezra's historical book is talking about the temple being rebuilt and uh, being established again as that's where we're going to pick it up. And uh, Ezra was the scribe in Nehemiah's day as well. And that's just the book over. We'll be in Nehemiah in just a few moments. But Ezra chapter 3 and verse 10 tells about once the foundation was laid, what happened. So in verse 10 of Ezra 3, verse 10, And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set their priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the son of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. Now it's amazing that it says that the Levites, the son of Asaph, when you study the book of Psalms, you'll find many of the Psalms were written by Asaph. And he was sort of sent in the motion of praising and worshiping God. And so that they line them up, they praise the Lord, and they do it after the ordinance of David, king of Israel. So look at verse 11. How, how did they praise the Lord? And they sang together by course, in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. Do you know that the book of Psalms is actually the true hymn book? The book of Psalms are songs. They're meant to be sung. And in Ephesians chapter 5, when it says, Be ye filled with the Spirit, don't be drunk with wine. Where is the next? says, But be filled with the Spirit. He says, Speaking to yourselves and, and singing... With songs, spiritual songs, psalms, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So our New Testament command is we're to be singing the psalms. When I, I, I mean, just this past week, I got in the book of Psalms a little bit in my personal time. and Boy, it picked me up. It helped me, folks. Because what's it doing? All they're doing is magnifying God. They're making much of our Savior and I don't know about you, but I need to see Him in these dark days. I need His help, and we need His help as God's people. And so may God save us from this endless loophole of trying to figure everything out. Just look to Jesus, okay? This is the whole point of Romans 3, and I'm trying to bring us what God is doing. And so when God shows up, the people begin to worship. They begin to praise. And uh, it says here in verse uh, 12, well, verse 11, And they sang together by course in praising and giving thanks unto the Lord. Because He's good. For His mercy endured forever toward Israel. 
And all the people shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. Now to get the context of it, they didn't have a meeting place. But now it's getting built back. The enemy had destroyed it. They're rebuilding it back. And things are picking up. Things are looking good. And the people of God are excited about that. Look at verse 12. But many of the priests and the Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men, who were old men, that had seen the first house when the foundation of the house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice, and many shouted aloud for joy. So what happened? The, the older ones... Girl. So what happened? The younger ones is just having them a spell. But the older ones that knew what it was to have the first, that have suffered without having it, and now it's getting brought back. What they do? They wept. Boy, you know those are tears of gladness. They wept. And it says, with a loud voice. And many shouted aloud for joy. So they're having these mixed feelings as God is no doubt answering their prayer. God had done a work in their life. And, and they're weeping with a loud voice and shouting for joy. And it says in verse 13, So the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. Now weeping and shouting is very different. But their emotions is so they're just so overwhelmed with gratitude toward God. And they're, finally, we're getting back what we've been having to live without. And they're excited not only for them, but for their kids. And then they look up over here and here's the younger ones are shouting for joy. Because they don't know anything about it. And it says they could not discern between the ones that were shouting for joy and those weeping. He says, for the people shouted with a loud shout, and the noise was heard far off. I long for days to be that way. I long to see the people of God get worked up about Jesus. I long for the days that people are really truly appreciate who God is and what God's doing. I mean, if it were not for the grace of God, we could be where they were and not even have a church to go to. Some of these third world countries don't have that. Some people aren't allowed to, 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 to do that. Even there's men in Canada going to jail still for having church still because they don't want them having it. I mean, it, it's amazing that what we take for granted, these people know what they have. And that... They're, they're excited and they're, they're grateful for what God's done. Look at Nehemiah chapter number 8. You'll find another instance of when God meets with His people. Nehemiah chapter 8. A lot is taking place in the book of Nehemiah. Jerusalem's walls have been torn down. The gates have been burned with fire. I met two men by the name of Sanballat and Tobias come in and cause a lot of heartache and heartbreak to the people of God. They're trying to discourage them from the work uh, to, of rebuilding the walls and getting the enemies out and establishing uh, Christ-centered worship again and biblical worship. And finally the work's done. The whole congregation... If you look in uh, Nehemiah 7, verse 66, it says the whole congregation together was 40 and 2,303 score. So 42,360 peoples in the congregation. And it says, Besides their manservants and their maidservants, of whom there were 7,300 and 37, and they had 245 singing men and singing women. They had a choir. 
Boy, he says their horses, 730 and 6. Their mules, 245. Their camels, 430. And five, 6,720 asses. And then you keep reading. They talk about the, the offerings, the gifts that they brought for the remnant, for the work. And then we get to chapter 8, the historical turning point of what real revival looks like. What, what a, a true appreciation for God looks like of a people that are hungry for God. Notice what it says in verse 1. And all the people gathered themselves together, watch it, as one man. You mean that congregation of 42,360 people met as one man? Absolutely. They had unity. That one man entered the street that was before the water gate. Now water, symbolically, is a picture of the Word of God. And it's amazing. They all came to the water gate <laughs> to hear the Scriptures. And so notice what it says later here in verse 1. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe. Ezra's the one that just recorded of what happened in Ezra 3. So Ezra the scribe, to bring the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded to Israel. So he said, Ezra, you bring the book. We want you to bring the book of the law of Moses. Look in verse 2. Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear... With understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday. Before the men and the women and all that could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood upon a pulpit of wood which they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood Matthiah and Shema and Hananiah and Uriah and Hilkiah and Messiah and under the right hand and to the left, Padiah and Mishael and Malachi and Hashem and Hashabanan and Zechariah and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. So let's think about this for a minute. When he opened the book, the people stood up. But he told us that he read from morning till midday. I wonder if they stood up the whole time. That's something to think about. I mean... Why did they stand? To be attentive. To show reverence to the reading of God's Word. And so that's why some preachers say, well, let's stand and reverence the reading of God. Where did they get it? it Nehemiah. Where did the pulpit of wood come from? Nehemiah. You, you get it. That's why it's there. That's why we have that. What was the purpose? The pulpit's the whole, it's a throne for the Word of God. It's a place to hold the Word while the man of God reads and explains so you can understand the Word of God. So, verse 6, And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, were lifting up their hands and bowed their heads and worship the Lord with what? Their faces on the ground. There it is again. When the Lord meets with His people, they were shouting, there's rejoicing, but ultimately there's humility, and people are getting low. They're getting all the way down on the ground. They are worshiping God, and they recognize His worthiness and their total unworthiness. And they worship. And uh, my, how we need this today. This, this whole 
section from Ezra and Nehemiah were living in dark days, like much like we are. Yet God was gracious enough to meet with His people. Just this past week, I've had two Psalms come to my mind. Psalm 42 and Psalm 63. And let's just go there just for a few minutes as, as we're continuing about this knowledge of God and what it means for God to worship His people. And what, what are we to ex- expect when God meets with His people? Psalm 42. But in each situation, even in Ezra's day, In Nehemiah's day, there was a hunger for God. There was a hunger for His Word. There was a hunger for this fresh encounter with God. And see, what we've got to understand is what the Old Testament was a picture of Jesus coming. And now, according to Hebrews, God done all this in in divers manner past. He spake of old by the prophets but hath in these last days spoken to us by His Son, Jesus Christ. So now anytime we want to hear from God or we want to meet with God, all we've got to do is open our Bible. It's amazing. People say, oh, well, I want what God's got for me, but they never picked their Bible up. How do you know what God's got for you if you don't read to see who God is and what He has for His people? But this hunger... For God is what's a missing element in our day. It seems like we're, we're satisfied with the way things are. We're not seeking God. We're not praying for God to do great things. We're just sort of winging it, hoping it's going to get better. But how much time do we spend praying and actually telling God that we long for these days? Psalm 42, verse 1. It says, As the heart, which is a deer... Panteth after the water brooks, so panteth my soul after thee, O God. My soul thirsteth for God. For the living God, when shall I come and appear before my God? Are you that thirsty for God? He says, my soul thirsteth for this living God. He wants to go and appear before his God. In other words, he, he's got a desire to leave this world to be in the presence of God. Notice in verse 3, he says, My tears have been my meat day and night. So it seems like this man's having a hard time. He can't stop weeping. He's hurting. He's wounded. He's worn out. He, he says it. He's constantly weeping. Do you see that? His tears have been His meat day and night. In the morning He's crying and in the night He's crying. He says, while they continually say unto me, where is thy God? Sounds like a Job and his buddies, don't it? Isn't it amazing? Soon as things go wrong in your life, everybody looks at you and says, Where's your God at now? That's what they say. If God's so good, why are you going through what you're going through? Why are you so discouraged? Why are you so depressed? Why are you just moping around and dragging around? If your God's so good, where's He at? That's what the book says there. But I like what he said in verse 4. When I remember these things, I pour out my soul in me, for I had gone with the multitude. I had went with them to the house of God, and with the voice of joy and praise, with a multitude that kept the holy day. In other words, he had some friends. Listen to me. The book said he got... He had some folks he could go with to help him get some help. And they went down to the house of God. And in his despair and in his desperation, he turned his cave into a cathedral. His his, uh, pain turned into praise. And he just begins to praise God. Is is that how your faith is? Can, 
can you rejoice regardless of what's going on around you? It, it may be hard. You may be in a dry place in life. But buddy, can you do you have such a relationship with God that you can just scratch you off a surface anywhere and just worship Him? That's what the psalmist is at. He says the holy day. And so they were worshiping. Then he asked the question, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why are you acting like this when you've got the Lord? And he says, Why art thou disquieted in me? Here it is. Hope thou in God. You see that? It appeared hopeless, but now he's turned his attention to God and he's saying, You need to hope in God. For I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. And that means his presence. Now last time I checked, if you're born again, you always have his presence. Verse 6, Oh my God, my soul is cast down within me. Therefore will I remember thee from the land of Jordan and of the Hermonites and from the hill of Mazar. So what's he do? He's recollecting what God has done for him in the past. He, he goes back to a time he was in the land of Jordan of the Hermonites and from the hill of Melzer. Something happened there. Oh yeah. Is there some encounters that you there, there's some landmarks, there are some oh, memorials in your life where you can't forget where God met with you, God met a need, God answered a prayer, God helped you through a tough time. And that's where the psalmist is at. Look in verse 7. He says, Deep calleth unto deep at the noise of the water spout. Or waterfalls. All thy waves and billows are gone over me. He's in deep water. Things are over his head. But look in verse 8. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. And in the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer under... The God of my life. What's he saying here? In the daytime God has commanded his loving kindness toward me. And if you ask anybody that battles with loneliness and depression, it's always nighttime that gets them. But the psalmist said he gives them a song in the night. Oh, the songwriter said it best. He gives us a song in the night season and all the day long. Aren't you glad that we got a God that even in your deepest heartbreak and heartache, the, the, the hardest place you've ever been, you, he, you're not separated from His loving kindness? Woo. And thank God when you're down and out, all of a sudden He gives you a song. Yeah. Woo. And I think about that song, His Eyes on the Spare. He says, I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eyes on the sparrow, and I know He watches over me. So that ought to help our souls to see a real life encounter of a man who says when he was at his lowest, he knew that God had commanded His love and kindness in the daytime. He gave him a night in the, a song in the night season. And he says, and a prayer, and my prayer unto the God of who? My life. He's not just a general God, he's the God of my life. Whew. Look at verse 9. I will say unto God, my rock. Now he's calling him a rock. Why hast thou forgotten me? Why go I mourning because of the oppression of my enemies? Why am I letting what people are saying and doing toward me that are my enemies, why is it getting the best of me when I have you? 
Let them do what they're going to do. Let them say what they're going to say. It doesn't change your standing with God, okay? He says, as with a sword in my bones, man, a sword in my bones, mine enemies reproach me, while thou say daily unto me, where's thy God? Why art thou cast down, O my soul? And why art thou disquieted within me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise Him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. You see that? I shall yet praise Him. Who's the health or the help of my countenance and my God? His circumstances hadn't changed, but he's learning that in this situation the Lord has brought him in. He's learning just to hope in God. So let me ask you something. Is there ever a time you and me ought to be without hope? Never. Because we have God. Now, this man's thirsting for this real vital relationship with God. He's not looking for some temporary experience. He's saying, I'm hoping in God. And I'm going to praise Him. See, a lot of people think that you can only praise God when you get the answer to your prayer. Some people think that you can only praise God when it's very evident God is at work in your life. But what is this psalmist teaching us? I want God whether it's good or whether it's bad. There's never an in season, out of season. You and me are to hope in God. We are to want God. We are to desire God. In days such as we're living in, we need to be praying and seeking God and say, God, we need you. Our hope's in you. Our hope ain't in another president. Our hope ain't in another kind of revival that would sweep through and weeks down the road everybody done forgot about it. Nobody remembers what the evangelist preached on anyway during that week. Yeah. Y'all know I'm telling you right. Our hope, we, we're starting to put our hope in the small things and not God. We must learn how to hope in God. This is where, this is what it means to encounter God, to Thirst for God is to long for God and to be filled by God. This psalmist got what he needs because he's turning to God. I wonder if we'd be honest tonight and say, I'm guilty of turning to other things, trying to fill that void that only God can have. I'm too busy hoping in all these little things when it ought to be me hoping in Him. That's, that's a big difference. Look in Psalm 63. This will be our last psalm tonight that I want to look at. I'm saving Isaiah 6 for next week. This is a David. Psalm of David when he was in the wilderness. Judah. Psalm 63, verse 1. It says, O God, Thou art my God. Early will I seek thee. My soul thirsteth for thee. My flesh longeth for thee in a dry and thirsty land where no water is. How dry are you tonight? How dry are we? I think we go through dry spells to get us thirsty. It's starting to cool off, but in these dog days of summers we've just had, it ain't too long you get in that heat and you start perspirating a little bit, you start getting thirsty. And what I've noticed in my own experience is that when the thermostat gets turned up, and the heat gets turned up in my life. I soon realize 
how weak and feeble and frail I am and how much I need Him. And I'm learning to really evaluate trials and troubles in my life. And I'm actually beginning to sort of see the providence of God is that God's using this moment, this particular instance, this dry season for the purpose to draw me closer to Him. We don't like the dry seasons. We don't like the wilderness. We, we don't like going without. But maybe this season of going without is going to cause you to really want Him. And then it's going to lead to an overflow of abundance of His presence in your life, His provision in your life where you find that which your soul's been lacking for so long. That's where David is in this psalm. He, he said, there ain't no water. I need... God's water. And notice what he goes a step further in verse 2. What's he really thirsting for is more than just water. Verse 2 tells us, To see thy power and thy glory, so as I have seen thee in the sanctuary. How many of us really long to see the power of God? And to see His glory. David numerous and undoubtedly had experienced this and saw this when he was in the sanctuary and now he's at a time he's not able to get to the sanctuary and he wants to see the power of God again. He wants to see God's glory. We've come to the place, and I've had to repent of this, you know, it's just, well, it's just the days we're living in, baloney. That's called fatalism. We'd soon live like it and say, well, this is just as good as it's going to get till we get to glory. Wake up! And the days of revival is gone. Have you spent any time praying about it? You have not. Because you asked. Don't have to be. We know. We have gotten comfortable with the way things are. Mm -hmm. And we're getting back mm -hmm. with the way things are. And we say, well, it's just the days we're living in. That's a cop out to get us to not want God, to long for God. It gives us to live a very weak Christian life. And we're settling for good over best. I long for days to see the people of God in love with Jesus again. I long for the power of God to break through to all the lies and deception that Satan has told our generation. Well, this is just the way that it is. It doesn't have to be. Because you really want something, you go for it, don't you? I say, let's go for God. Let's go spend time fasting. That's a real thing and that's a biblical thing. Fasting, praying, seeking God, longing for God, asking God to do a work in our lives. What's this do? It squashes all our pride because we realize we're all dependent upon God. And nothing's going to change till we acknowledge that we need God. Do you see the trend through all these Old Testament accounts I've been to? All of them's recognize their need for God. We're self-sufficient society. We're self-made people, so to say. We have become like Laodicea. We're rich, increased the goods, and have need of nothing. Not even God until we get a bad doctor's report. 
Tell your kids in a wreck, you don't know if they're going to make it. And everybody starts running, oh, we need to get a hold of God. Why is it we got to let a tragedy come before we recognize we need Him? That's sad, isn't it? It's sad. I feel like the songwriter, I can't even walk without Him holding my hand. Jesus said, without me ye can do nothing. But David said, I long to see thy power and thy glory. So I've seen in the sanctuary. Because thy loving kindness is better than life. The love and the kindness that God showed is better than life. If all I had was that one moment in time when Jesus came to me when I was lost in my sin and saved me, if that's all I ever got, that's better than life itself. If He saved me and then I died the next day, it was better than life itself because I've experienced His loving kindness. David said that. All of God's people. You, you see something? When you get in the presence of God, you can't get away from His loving kindness. And he says, it's better than life. And he says, my lips shall praise thee. Thus will I bless thee while I live. I will lift up my hands in thy name. My soul shall be satisfied with the marrow and the fatness and my mouth shall praise thee with joyful lips. Then he says, When I remember thee upon my bed, and meditate, meditate on thee in the night watches, because thou spend my help, whew, therefore in the shadow of thy wings I will rejoice. My soul followeth hard after thee, thy right hand upholdeth me, but those that seek my soul to destroy it shall go in the lower parts of the earth. They shall fall by the sword. They shall be a portion for the foxes. But the king shall rejoice in God. And everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. Seems to me David ain't too much worried about his enemies or adversaries. He knows his God. And God's going to work it all out in the end. You see what happens? Everybody gets so consumed with God, their problems ain't as big as they thought they were. That's what I long to see among God's people again. That's what I want for you. And that's what you ought to want for me. And that's what we all ought to share in. And so let's make it a matter of prayer. Let's spend some time praying and asking God, God, meet with us. We long for you. We want you. We want what you got for us. And not just because camp meeting's coming up, because we need it Sunday morning, Sunday evening, and Wednesday night. Amen. Not only that, we need it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, every day that ends in why? We need Him. So let's quit acting like we don't and say, God, we need You. And let's see what God will do. It's what happens when God meets with